Lincoln Riley cares about defense. I know some of you still don't believe that. We will do our best in the next 60 minutes to convince you, or at least Tim will do his best in the next 60 minutes to convince you right here at Trojan Conquest Live. It's another Monday night, folks. So this should be your home on Monday nights, 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, with, of course, Matt Zemek from Trojan's Wire and Tim Prankley, our multi-dimensional host right here at the Voice of College Football. Guys, how are we doing tonight? Doing great. Well. I'm loving the Matt Ends hire. Yeah. Yes, we have another Matt in the fold at USC. Matt Ents via North Dakota State. He will certainly probably, I would think, enjoy his winters uh, going forward uh, here. Uh, and then also be working with the linebackers, Matt. Yeah, it's uh, it's a beginning for Ents, and uh, it's a be it's a new beginning for USC. And you know, so one thing that Tim and I talked about on our Friday Colin show was what's going on with the defensive staff. You know, why haven't we seen more movement? Why haven't we seen more action in terms of Danton Lynn filling out uh, his defensive staff? Because and, and, and again, like, you know, to, to give everyone a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here, let's let's all step back and remind ourselves it is so dumb that we have the portal open right now and we have the early signing period right now while coaches are trying to latch on to jobs and they're trying to coach uh, their teams in bowl games. It's really dumb. And obviously that does complicate things for USC, for all the other schools and co head coaches that are trying to fill out staff. So that's, you know, that's there. And uh, we have to acknowledge that. But nevertheless, it was beginning to get a little concerning that USC wasn't filling out the defensive staff. You know, because you, you obviously you do want to get on the recruiting trail. You do want to, you know, make an, an, an impact in the portal. So you want to get as many hires on board to say, here's what we're looking at for all our di different defensive uh, position spots. This is the quality of coaching you can expect. So the you know it was beginning to get a little concerning that staff staff slots weren't getting filled out. So now with Matt Ens, first off, getting a guy who's extremely credentialed. I mean, you're getting a multi national champion head coach at the FCS level, and he wanted he wanted to come. Like you don't leave the North Dakota State dynasty. You know, if you're if you're king of a of an empire, I don't care where that empire is, whether it's in, uh, you know, the Dakotas or uh, Boise or you know Texas or Memphis, wherever. You know, being king of a locality, pretty sweet gig. You know, you'll never uh, have to pay for a drink or a meal. You know, everyone wants to kiss the ring. You know, if if you have it made in any locality. Uh, you don't leave that for just anything. You know, you you leave it for something that you think is going to be special. So, wow, Lincoln Riley convinces a North Dakota State head coach, the head coach of a dynastic power, to come to USC. And you know, people are going to say, "I mean, you already alluded to it, Mark. You know, you get to spend your winters in Los Angeles instead of uh, the Dakotas." Okay, but still, like you were having a very successful run. You don't interrupt that again for just anything. So that tells me that, you know, all right, you know, it's nice to talk about valuing defense. It's nice to talk about physicality, but we needed to see actions match the rhetoric. We needed to see deeds match the words. And this is concrete proof like this. This is really solid in terms of actually doing things that reinforce that back up your claims that you are going to value defense. I mean, if you were going to just say, hey, I'm going to hire a two-time national champion head coach as my linebackers coach and a defensive assistant for my young uh, new defensive coordinator, you would say, yeah, that 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 looks like you're really serious about defense. I mean, if you were going to just come up with a plot point or a storyline, you would pretty much do that. And the other last detail for me to mention before I throw it over to Tim for his thoughts is that, aha, this is why it took a little longer, right? This is why it took uh, a little more time to get this particular staffer on board because, well, North Dakota State's playing playoff football right now. So obviously that, that was delicate 
in terms of when to move, when to act on this thing. So like that, that piece of the puzzle makes a little more sense. If this is a guy that USC was targeting, no wonder it took a little bit longer uh, to put this thing together. But Tim, your, your reaction to, to this hire? No, I think you said it best. You know, we, we, you and I on air, off air, we're talking about it's great to say these wonderful things about the defense comes first. We're going to build an elite defense. Uh, I think a lot of fans were waiting, hearing that and, and believing it was going to happen and believe it's going to happen. And there's been so much momentum against Lincoln Riley saying he has this huge blind spot. He doesn't care about the defense. Uh, the, the steps he just took by uh, the money and also going back, just rewind. Remember at the, at the press conference, he talked about the amazing alignment they had at the university from, from Carol Folt all the way down to him and that they were going to they were gonna provide him everything he would need to be successful. Well, now he's asking for it and um, they're, they're putting up the money and they're putting forth some good money to get these hires. You know, uh, Lynn didn't come over cheap. And uh, right now you have one of the hottest names uh, as defensive coordinator, young name coming up. And now you, you double that down. The issue is, is now you kind of balance out that, you know, what was the big thing we we're talking about, Matt? We're saying that, you know, Lynn's is great, but what's this, what's the deficit? What's the one thing we could pick out? Ah, oh, the experience. Well, you pair him up with a guy like Matt Entz and then boom, now you have it. On top of it, we've been talking about for weeks, Matt, we've been talking about an enforcer, right? I don't know. I don't know a hell of a lot about Matt Entz. I've been trying to catch up, trying to figure it all out, but that dude looks like an ass kicker too. He might be that ass kicker guy that, that we need in the program. I definitely know he hits. I know they're going to want to hit. I know it's not going to be soft. We're talking about changing everything, about including practice. I think now with Lynn and and with Entz, uh, you're going to see a huge difference on defense. I talked about the postgame show after the UCLA game. When we saw UCLA, I said the one thing I did see in that UCLA team was they were ready. They were they were ready to they were ready to go. You know, their, their attention to detail, uh, and they all seemed like on the same page. And he got there like what February or March. So the fact that he was able to get that done so fast and get them on the same page, uh, now you're bringing in Entz. Uh, he talked about, he was just talking about one of the few videos I got to see about him is he was talking about uh, how he defends against hurry up offense, right? Uh, and no huddle. And he was talking about how he slims it down. So, you know, in the end zone and third downs, the offense got to slow down so you could slow down. He's all, but when, when there was middle, you know, you're in the middle of the field, he's talking about trimming down the playbook so the guys know exactly where to be. Then setting up trash cans on either side and going back from, from formation to formation to have the guys on the fly making changes and getting the right formations based on the calls he had. And he slimmed down the playbook. After watching this last season, this guy's just singing everything I want to hear. We're going to let the, our athletes go out there and fly around and play football. So I'm, I'm excited. Let's get this one from Adam, uh, our resident uh, Lincoln Riley skeptic. And and hey, you know, like skepticism of Lincoln Riley is warranted at a time like this. So just want to call it straight with Adam. Like, you know, the, the skepticism is legitimate. Did, did Lynn or Riley make the hire? Well, first off, Adam, I would tell you that when Lincoln Riley hired Danton Lynn and when they, they had their interview, I'm sure that Lincoln Riley and Danton Lynn had a conversation of, hey, who do you want uh, for your defensive staff? How do you how do you want to populate and fill out uh, that staff? I mean, like what either a specific name or a kind of coach that you would like? And I'm sure that you know with Tim making the astute point about you know experience being the one thing at the collegiate level. You know, Danton Lynn has plenty of NFL experience, but he's he's been at coaching college just one year. You know. I'm sure Riley and Lynn, Adam, had a conversation about, you know, who do who do you want on your staff? You know, what what how you know how do you see all of this shaping up? And I'm sure they got Danton Lynn's uh, opinions and preferences in terms of what he'd like. And so I would have to imagine that at some point Danton Lynn said, "Hey, give me an experienced guy, you know, along with me who can be kind of a sounding board and who you know values toughness, values hitting, <laughs> physicality." the same way that I do. So Adam, I'm sure that it was collaborative. Like it's not as though Riley, you know, just did this thing unilaterally. Uh, you know, it, it was a collaboration. And, 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 you know, this tells me that when Jen Cohen and Lincoln Riley hired uh, Danton Lynn, that, you know, there was certainly a conversation about how do we branch this out? How do we map things out in terms of several different steps. And of course, you know, as fans, seeing time tick away, tick, 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 the days just melting away without a whole lot of 
incoming portal activity and without the, that surge in recruiting that we're all hoping for, you know, those were restless days. Like we can't deny that. And, and, and people were right to be nervous and antsy, but you waited a few extra days to get a, a coach of this caliber to help your young hotshot defensive coordinator that the ex, those extra days, I, I would have to say are worth it. And you're, you're going into the big 10 too. Like that's another thing worth mentioning. You are going into a slobber knocker conference. You are going into uh, a league where, you know, you need, you know, when you go to Kinnick stadium for an 11 AM breakfast game or a brunch game, you know, and it's 35, 40 degrees, you know, you, you better bring your hitting shoes. You better be ready to slug uh, with the Hawkeyes. And so getting uh, Matt Entz from the Dakotas, like that, that tells me, okay, we're, we're ready to be become this tough guy, Midwestern street fight, alley cat team that, that can go in and win a 17, 10, big 10 slug fest, if that's what it takes to win in this conference. And getting coaches is vital, no question, but coaches need players. And getting one in from the SEC that was a very productive player for an outfit um, that was overmatched each and every time they stepped on the field in conference play, at least. Nate Clifton, big 6'5", 280-pound defensive tackle, not exactly oversized as a defensive tackle, had 30 tackles last year, seven and a half tackles for loss, five and a half sacks, and 18 quarterback hurries from a defensive tackle position. That's an impressive number. And so Clifton uh, is now a USC Trojan. I think the main thing to say about this is that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, pre and pretend that I watched a lot of Vanderbilt football. Okay. So I'm not going to say that I have this deep inside read on Clifton, but I'm just going to make a general point that when you, we had guys coming in uh, through the portal, such as like Anthony Lucas, Jack Sullivan, uh, others, you know, over the previous off season, you know, we liked their talent. They seem to offer a lot of potential, but of course, there was the Alex Grinch problem. And so to me, with, without knowing a whole lot about Nate Clifton, just the fact that you're getting this raw prospect and he's, and he's going to be coached by Danton Lynn and Matt Entz, but I mean, especially Danton Lynn, uh, like just, just having that reality is going to add value for each of these USC uh, defensive uh, transfer prospects. Now, Let's be honest, like USC needs some splashes in the portal. I don't I don't think Nate Clifton qualifies as a splash, but just the fact that you're getting you're accumulating some defensive depth and you know that Danton Lynn is going to be able to get his hands on uh, these and other uh, defensive portal prospects. That should be a sign of encouragement for USC. You're on mute, Tim. Oh, sorry. I, I don't know a whole bunch uh, about him as well. Matt didn't watch a lot of Vanderbilt football as well. Uh, I'm not going to get excited either. I, I think I overdid it last year. I was really excited about, you know, Sullivan coming in from Purdue. and like, oh, you know, big guys to get there. He had, you know, flashed a little bit during the spring game, spring game. And I got excited about that. I, let's let's just let these guys get in. Um, I agree. Uh, we can talk about later. I and mean, we got the we got the sign day coming up. We keep hoping for some big splash. Uh, now we have a long snapper and and uh, uh, a rush end, you know, a defensive end from Vanderbilt. We'll see the, the quarterback hires coming up pretty quick. By the way, guys, on that point, make sure if you haven't already, make sure you're down there by Matt. You subscribe because as soon as we get our quarterback, and we will be getting a quarterback, uh, we will go live that day with the Colin show. I'm sure there's going to be again. Like always, there's going to be people celebrating and some people commiserating. So uh, that's what we're here for. Come join us for the only caller-driven call-in show here on YouTube for USC football. He had some decent stats, again, for defensive tackle. Typically, they don't rack up the, the flashy numbers, but I'm, I'm curious to see where these numbers came from, what games. He did have a sack against Georgia. He had a sack against Ole Miss. He had a sack against Auburn. 
he had a half a sack against Florida. So he racked up some numbers, one and a half tackles for loss against Kentucky. So he racked up the bulk of these sacks and tackles for loss in conference play against some quality opponents. So that's a good sign. Uh, sometimes you'll see, especially with four non-conference games um, from these SEC teams, and as Tim likes to outline from time to time, playing the the uh, fair share of cupcakes like in Alabama A&M, Hawaii, uh, Nevada, Las Vegas was also, although not a cupcake this year for Vandy, that um, most of his production, in terms of the, the numbers that you're looking for, uh, the sacks, the tackles for loss, the quarterback hurries, came against the better teams. I don't think he played. Um, I'm not certain on this, but I think he's uh, he plays outside. I don't think he plays uh, defensive tackle. I think he's yeah, 280. I would think not. Although they've no. got him listed as a defensive tackle on the Vanderbilt website. Interesting. Well, you know that's one thing. <clears throat> I did think I heard him. I think I heard him say somewhere um, that he he could play anywhere along the line. So, and if you listen to uh, Lynn when he talked about it he likes his guys to be versatile and be able to play multiple positions because that allows them not to have to substitute in, which we all know, then, then, you know, uh, it slows them down. They can stay out there and they can give different looks with the same personnel. So, uh, maybe he's that Swiss army knife he's talking about. One thing I would add to this conversation, just on a general level, you know, again, I didn't like do film study of Vanderbilt. Uh, I didn't watch the Commodores close these past Come season. Come on, man. All right. But I know that they regressed. They regressed from 2022. The program took a step back this year. And so I think one thing that uh, USC was considering is that whatever Nate Clifton did, he pretty much did it on an island. You know, he did it in terms of by his own uh, force of will, his own skill. It's not as though, you know, another, uh, another Vanderbilt defensive lineman was soaking up a double team and enabling him uh, to come free. It was definitely not that kind of situation that Clifton pretty much had to do what he did by himself. I'm, I'm sure that that was part of the calculus that you, you, you put him next to Bear Alexander, you put him next to, you know, some of the other talented guys USC has up front developed by Sean Nua, and maybe this guy can cook. So I'm sure that that was part of uh, the thought process for USC. Appreciate y'all being here on another Monday night here at the Voice of College Football Trojan Conquest Live. We, in particular, want to thank our new member here. Up, oh, we have lost. Uh, that was. Uh, it's no longer highlighted. Unfortunately, I can't oh. find it now. Where's our new member? There, it is. there he is, up top. Juice twenty two eighty eight. Uh, Juice, thanks for joining us here as a new YouTube member at the Voice of College Football on our USC channel. So thank you for that. And again, one of the great highlights for joining the channel and becoming a YouTube member here is Matt and I have produced 13 uh, really special uh, deep football discussion segments that you'll want to join us for. They are posted here for all channel members. Uh, deep dive on USC football and many of the discussions as it relates both to historical items that project forward as well. And Matt did a great job of selecting a, a number of, of topics that relate to where USC is headed, meaning the Big Ten and, and uh, the Lincoln-Riley aspect of the leadership of USC football as it stands right now going into the future. Good stuff. Great uh, segments there. Uh, from Matt and myself. And in, and in a couple months, Mark, once uh, the season ends and you get to rest those uh, golden pipes of yours and you get to just kind of, uh, you know, take a vacation or what, do whatever it is you do uh, after the season ends, we'll, we'll start uh, recording some of those uh, choice cuts once again to add to our collection here at the Voice of College Football. Do I take a vacation? Okay. Matt says I can take a vacation, so we're going to get on that. I hope so. Hardest working man in show business. Uh, I think it's one of a, the three of us here. I, I don't know if it's me, though. Uh, it Matt's is you. The, it is definitely you. We talked about it. We're on one channel. You're on like 25. 
<clears throat> good stuff out of these guys without matt without tim we don't have a channel here we don't have all the uh, shows that they do and for these guys to respond to breaking news as often as they do and open the op open up the phone lines and uh talk to all of you it's a great um addition here at the voice of college football no doubt yeah roger dodger we are going to correct that this uh this off season all right, where are we headed after the Nate Clifton news? Uh, you know, what what people are talking about in the chat, Mark and Tim, is uh, the rest of the defensive staff. And, and, I, and I would say this in terms of the, the remainder of the defensive staff. I've been on record as saying if there's one coach to retain from the 2023 defensive staff, it's Sean Nua. And it's basically because, you know, he did get a lot out of Bear Alexander. Like Bear Alexander delivered he was one of the few defensive players you could look at in 2023 and say you know what he pretty much lived up to expectation he brought it pretty much every week you know he was a good player a productive player he had an impact um he needed we needed more bear alexanders uh it, on that roster in 2023 so if you wanted to retain sean nua like the i would i could live with that but you definitely can't retain dante williams you know, absolutely, absolutely not. No way with the way the secondary uh, performed in 2023. So we're having a lot of uh, debate and discussion in the chat about the defensive staff and, and you know, you know, cl clean house, which, you know, clean, clean house would be reasonable because you do want to start fresh in a certain sense. And you are starting fresh at defensive coordinator. But if there was one guy to retain, it would be Sean Nua. But you cannot under any circumstances retain Dante Williams as a position coach. Now, maybe if he's willing to take on a recruiting only kind of role, fine, but but he should be nowhere close to, a, to an actual hands-on position group uh, coaching responsibility. So I want to address that particular point of debate and discussion going on in the chat here at the Voice of College Football. So, Tim, you had mentioned that you and Matt are going to jump on live when there is a quarterback signed. Is that what I heard? Yeah, well, uh, Lincoln Riley had expressed the fact that he wanted to, um, to pursue what he is. He's pursuing quarterbacks uh, in, in the portal right now. Um, and we were just talking with Ry Dawson, the fact that you know, Ry Dawson is banking on his uh, young, unproven five-star to take over because Dylan Gabriel has decided to go over to Oregon, so... It was like Oregon filled one of their slots, but there are a number of blue chip, exciting, proven quarterbacks, um, whether they're blue chips from high school, you know, that big names um, coming on up, or if you have guys proven, you know, Cam Ward, people are wondering where he's going to go. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. There's just, it's really the piece of the fall. And there was a little hint today that there was some action was going to happen, but I don't think much has actually happened in the way of uh, the quarterbacks making a decision. But, you know, once Cam Ward makes his decision, I think that's going to be like a domino effect. So what are your wish lists, each one of you? And is does that differ from what you think that they're able to pursue or are pursuing? Go, go ahead. I, you've written a lot about this. Yeah, well, I you know, just me, I would have preferred Grayson McCall, but it doesn't seem as though he's on uh, – USC's radar, but you know, if Dylan Gabriel going to Oregon in terms of the evolving chessboard uh, at quarterback for USC in the portal, it seems as though Will Howard and, and Cam Ward are the two top names on the board. If you, I'm not going to make a prediction about what's going to happen. I'm not that smart. I'm not that uh, hooked up to the you know the the insider of the uh, insider industry points. Like I, I'm definitely. Uh, would not have uh, guessed that uh, Shohei Otani was going to the Dodgers Friday morning when, you know, all the reports were coming out about how he was on the flight to Toronto. So I'm not that uh, hooked up in terms of knowing what's going to happen. But just if you ask for my preference, Will Howard or Cam Ward, I would go with Will Howard. Uh, I, I am not comfortable with Cam Ward's uh, erratic decision making, uh, obviously, when he's on. Pretty awesome to see. But are you going to get the good version of Cam Ward on a consistent basis. Give me Will Howard, who, you know, coached by Chris Kleiman. So I think he has a better foundation in terms of how he was coached uh, at Kansas State. Uh, and, and also, you know, if USC is trying to play a more physical style in which the defense 
is doing more to carry the workload for the team and you don't have to be a hero you know you just make the right read you make the sound percentage play will howard i think fits the evolving vision uh for usc better than cam ward does uh let's play a little just a numbers game here uh just to kind of illustrate the concept you know do you want a guy who's going to be a 10 on a scale of one to 10 two three games a year but then on several other games is going to be a six or a 6.5 or do you want the guy who's going to be 8.5 every game consistently and i think that's really the comparison contrast between cam ward and will howard ward's going to give you a few perfect tens but he's going to be going to give you a few sixes maybe even a four will howard's going to be eight eight point five with regularity and that that is the guy usc needs a lot more of uh especially if you know if you're and if you're trusting that danton lynn and Matt Enns can get this defense figured out in 2024. And if you want to continue the whole, you know, everything we're going to do as this team is to improve the defense. You got a guy six foot five, 240, that can run, that can put his nose head down, has proven he can do that. Uh, in in Will Howard, the fact that you need those, I was talking about, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago we were on the show talking, you know, in the goal line, right, in, in, in the red zone, when you need that the tough third third short. This defense, this offensive line. While I'm excited about the sophomores, the true sophomores, you know, the freshmen this year that are coming in, uh, it's it's going to be anything but a polished, uh, a polished product next year. So I, I actually do think having a mobile quarterback, a guy when things kind of break down, he can just you know read, run, you know, and then go. Uh, I think that'd be a huge benefit to uh, to USC. Um, let's get this item from logan dowell here howard's thrown 48 tds 24 ints not that good logan i mean on the surface the numbers would tell you that he's not that great but let's remember skylar thompson got injured at kansas state uh, a few seasons ago and howard was thrown into the fire as a backup he was asked to be qb1 uh under very difficult circumstances he had a lot of games in which he was learning on the job so you have to look at the numbers uh in that adjusted context that you know a lot of the the numbers that that will howard accumulated at kansas state under chris Kleiman were as you know an emergency fill-in quarterback not the guy who was expected to to handle that team as the qb1 uh on opening day he played a lot of games as the backup filling in uh, for an injured starter and a number of the games he played, he was hurt himself. Uh, and he went in and out of the lineup. Uh, you know, he, he's a tough dude. And so the, those numbers, while they might not look all that great on the surface, there's a, there's a lot of underlying context that would tell you that, you know, when you adjust for situations, when you adjust for adversity faced, he's actually a lot better than the surface statistics are going to tell you. 24 touchdowns, 10 picks this uh, last season. And le yeah, let's consider this. So Matt's referring to a 2020 season and 2021 Skylar Howard or Skylar Thompson is the starting quarterback at Kansas State. And so Will Howard's the beginning of his career started with nine touchdowns and 11 picks those first two seasons. Adrian Martinez transferred in from Nebraska won the starting job or was possibly given the starting job in 2022 when he went down will howard propelled that offense to another level that led them to a big 12 championship um and his last two seasons you're looking at a much better touchdown to pick rate of 39 to 14. so that's part Thank of you, the way you should do that that's why you get paid the big bucks mark <laughs> I'm here to pick you up, Matt. You you, you closed out about ninety eight percent of it. I just caught the final two to just to just to underline it. Um, here's one. This is a pretty good one. Um, so first off, thank you, CH. Enjoyed listening to the show last season. And this one, who do you expect to step up from the reserve role to a starting role next season on both sides of the ball? Um, I'm I'm gonna cherry pick it, and I'm gonna go with. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the receivers, uh, you know, and uh, which which receiver it is you can pick, because because 
Uh, you know, from like Deuce Robinson might be one of your more more likely ones to step up and have a big role on offense. But I'm really excited. I mean, I, I've been talking about it all, all year long. Uh, I'm I'm really excited to see what Quinton Joyner can do. Uh, he he we'll talk about a uh, you know he he's he's I think he will have a big role on the team. He showed flashes. This guy is this guy's a hard nosed runner from Texas, um, and he's got wheel. He's got speed. He can break. He showed it last year. He can break one any moment. So I'm excited on the offensive side to to see those guys. Who do you got anyone on offense, Matt? You can think of. I was surprised you didn't go with uh, one of the freshman offensive linemen uh, who's gonna uh, have a big breakout uh, season next year. And and to I me, I was cherry picking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so CH, good question. I'm less focused on a player, and that might seem like a cop out, I admit, but I'm more about seeing whole units develop and evolve. And and really, I would like to see the offensive line and the defensive line substantially evolve um, from last season. I think you have a lot of untapped talent because of Alex Grinch, you know, obviously not being able to develop players uh, really well. So I think there's a lot of candidates uh, on the front four uh, that could step up from a reserve role uh, to a starting role. And if that happens, you know, USC is going to be a lot better there. And then, you know, Josh Henson needs to answer the bell and bring those young offensive linemen, uh, you know, into form in 2024. And if they're as nasty as Tim Prangley has been saying they are, then they are. USC is going to be USC is going to be in really good shape. We need to see it. But, but uh that that's a definite definite source of hope uh, for the Trojans next year. And there's a lot to pick on the offense side. On the defensive side, probably gonna go with um, I think Braylon Shelby can really break out next year, uh, rush end. And then I I like you know there's some some plays here and there with Elijah Hughes. This guy's just quick, you know. So um, th those are two guys. Those are two guys I I think they could make a, a jump next year. Deuce Robinson caught 15 balls including a touchdown over 20 yards per reception for a tight end. And I was going to say, as I checked that, my memory of him flashing this past season was, oh, yeah, uh, that's the guy that, uh, of course, was a huge tight end recruit addition to this team. And here he is flashing what could be a regular uh, targeted you know, tight end in this offense that could be very difficult for safeties and slot corners and, and the like to handle. Uh, are you guys pretty pleased with what you saw out of him this year? Yeah. And it, I think really quickly, um, Riley put it to rest that he's not a tight end. He, they, they said they recruit him as a, he, he was in the recruiting service as a tight end. Um, but he was recruited as a, as a wide receiver. Um, so you got, you know, think, think of like, a. London, a big, big guy receiver going down the field. But the guy that a lot of people don't know that could have, could just as very well have another breakout receiver is J Jacoby Lane. You know, he, he could also, this guy, a freak from Arizona, a guy can jump out of the building. He's long, uh, tall. He, he could have an amazing season as well. Yeah, receivers, whoever the quarterback is, you know, there's, there's about three or four young receivers that are coming out. You know, we haven't talked about Zachariah Branch, you know, or Makai Lemon. These get, the receivers that are coming in, it's, you know, Mark, you know, you know, um, Ohio State. I mean, there are certain schools that just get wide receivers. And uh, USC, this bumper crop right now, I think is going to be something really special. Drake in London, terms of who my, I believe, I was just going to say as a side note, Drake London, who I believe uh, came within about three or four yards of making a remarkable game-winning touchdown reception uh, Sunday. Uh, but But anyway, I digress, Matt. Go ahead. Yeah, in terms of my evaluation of Deuce Robinson, I mean, you know, I, he didn't have, I think, as good a year as people hoped. But of course, when you're evaluating the younger uh, offensive players on this roster from 2023, you know, like the pieces didn't come together the way anyone expected. And really, it starts with the offensive line not being as good as uh, we either hoped or thought. But the other thing, and this is particularly relevant to an evaluation of Deuce Robinson, what did we have at USC in 2022? You had Jordan Addison taking the top off of defenses, really stretching the field. He made all the other receivers on the field better, significantly better. And we were expecting Dorian Singer and also Mario Williams to provide that same level of impact and that same kind of on-field effect. 
where defenses were going to be so focused on dealing with them that it would really open up space and open up opportunities for the other receivers uh, on the field. That did not happen. So Deuce Robinson, you know, wasn't able to have a breakout season, but it's not just him. It's it's he's existing within a larger context where the WR1 needs to be that hammer, needs to be, you know, that that reliable elite downfield playmaker who just scrambles the rest of a defense's positioning, scheme, alignment, attention, um, pre, you know, pre-snap awareness. And so the regression at WR1 from Addison to Singer and Mario Williams uh, from 2022 to 2023, that should definitely enter into an evaluation of Deuce Robinson because he was supposed to be operating within a context where his teammates were going to be able to make things easier for him. That did not happen. And, and it really does bring up the point that, you know, can Zachariah Branch become that electric Jordan Addison level receiver in 2024, maybe he will need, you know, two years to become that guy. So like USC needs to go into the portal as it did for Addison and get that, that big dog uh, at wide receiver who can have an Addison like effect on, on a defense. You get that, then you're putting Deuce Robinson and those other guys in a much, much better position to improve. I see. I got a lot of fans of uh, Jacoby Lane in the chat. I, I'm I'm right there with you guys. Matt, do you? I'm, I mean, Mark, did you have this up? Because before we chase all our fans away, go ahead and. Hey, <laughs> of course I've got that up <laughs> for a reason. Yes, we like to mix things up a little bit, but that is technically our next show on our network of shows. So Tuesday's a big day here at the Voice of College Football: Oklahoma, Iowa, Nebraska, Michigan. Oregon and the Big 12 show as well, but it's kicked off uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time over on the Oklahoma channel. Also, please catch us on the Big 12 channel. We are endeavoring to build that up uh, quickly here. So the Big 12 channel, and I'll leave that link in the chat and troll, do whatever you want, head on over. We've got Parker Thune, who does a remarkable job with uh, Rivals, does a great job, joins us for the Oklahoma live show. Uh, when we can track him down. So Tuesdays, 11 a.m. Eastern time, that's just this week. And then we're also going to do a double header of Oklahoma Live, the next one coming up on Thursday, Tim. So we've got a Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday. I'll be there. No, no, I won't. For you. <laughs> Talking Sooners. And listen, people, we have people are, just people are asking who, should, who, who is a wide receiver you actually should go after in the portal. Julian Fleming of Ohio State. And a couple people have mentioned him uh, – in the chat, we mentioned him uh, last week on the show. Uh, I would reiterate that he would be a fine choice. I haven't looked at the full wide receiver market, but uh, Ju you, you could do a lot, lot worse than Julian Fleming, I would think. Well, there's rumors that he and um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Who's your quarterback, Mark? Kyle McCord. Kyle McCord are visiting Nebraska as a package deal. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> Julian Fleming is also a Pennsylvania boy, so the Penn Staters would love to get him as well. We hey, got 205 hey, really hey. quick. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead, Tim. No, go I was ahead. just going to say, we got 205 again on here. So if you guys haven't already done it, uh, please make sure we're trying to, you guys, we are absolutely trying to get to 5,000 subs. Uh, we're getting really close. Uh, but if you haven't already right below mass subscription, and if you uh, go hit that, like, if you do subscribe, make sure you hit the bell notification. So, you know, when we go live. So when we do get our quarterback, you guys will join us. Uh, to talk about whoever we do pick up. So, Mark, you mentioned Penn State. That reminded me of another uh, couple of uh, related items to, to talk about here on our show at the Voice of College Football. So, Penn State, Manny Diaz takes the open head coaching job uh, at Duke. You know, so, you know, and so Penn State now has a vacancy at defensive coordinator. Boy, good thing USC pounced on Danton Lynn. Because he played at Penn State. And so if he was still at UCLA, you can bet you better believe that James Franklin would have been all over that. So USC really got first in line ahead of Penn State with Manny Diaz uh, grabbing the coaching job at Duke. So that that is an important point 
to note. Like USC's timing was exquisite uh, on that front. And staying in the Big Ten, which, of course, you know, this is where USC is going to play its next uh, uh, football season. So, so it's t- very much germane to, to USC's future. Uh, notable that Michigan State hired Joe Rossi of Minnesota as its new defensive coordinator. And I bring that up just because not Jim Leonard. And so so now all eyes are on Happy Valley and James Franklin to see who he'll come up with as defensive coordinator. You know, this and this is this is kind of like the back end of the defensive coordinator search at USC. Like obviously USC got its man, Danton Lynn, made the hire and we're moving forward with Danton Lynn, but you know, part of the 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 the, the full story of this search is you know, it wasn't Jim Leonard, but it wasn't Jim Leonard, but you didn't get Jim Leonard. And so it's just noteworthy that Michigan State didn't slash couldn't land Jim Leonard. And so if Penn State does not land Jim Leonard, it, we can, I think, be pretty uh, confident in saying that Jim Leonard did not want any defensive coordinator job in the market, right? Because if he did want a defensive coordinator job, Chances are he'd want to stay in the Big Ten, the conference that he knows, the region where he's comfortable in terms of recruiting, in terms of uh, you know knowing you know the kinds of players, knowing the kinds of offenses that he's going up against. Like Jim Leonard probably wouldn't take a Big Twelve job, you know. Like what what special appeal would there be for him there, or an ACC job? You know, it d- doesn't make sense. Now maybe an SEC job, maybe if there's a high end SEC job. Uh, available like that might be a little bit tempting. Uh, you know, let's remember Dave Aranda was defensive coordinator at Wisconsin, and then he went to LSU, won a national championship. Uh, so maybe you'd think that Jim Leonard might get a job in the SEC, but like he wouldn't go to most other conferences, most other programs. So if Penn State does not hire Jim Leonard as defensive coordinator, we can be pretty sure that Jim Leonard is is holding out either for a head coaching job or the other industry rumor for an NFL defensive coordinator position. And, and, and I, and I talk about these things just so that none of us are left with that lingering. What if, you know, we could have gotten Jim Leonard. Well, he just wasn't interested. I mean, it's looking like that. And if Penn state doesn't land Jim Leonard, that closes the door on that whole discussion and we can move on with our lives. Yeah. And I'm curious. So you guys, um, in the chat, if you guys will go ahead and do me a favor, like it or, uh, don't like it or undecided. If you can let us know just by saying like it, don't like it right now in the chat, let us know what you think of the, of the ends higher. Do you think this is the guy that's going to bring the toughness to USC's practices? Is it going to change the, you know, the, the, the soft culture that, that Matt has talked about? Do you think that he's the right guy? Um, I know a lot of people were naming a bunch of linebacker coaches earlier, but do you like the hire? Don't like it? Let us know in the chat. I am going to create a poll right now. We're working on it. Ah, but can you post the, the, the poll? I actually can. I am gonna... doing my best here. Looks like we're getting a lot of positive feedback in the chat. I think I got it. Do you approve of the Matt Entz hire? Please let us know. Got some smart fans here at the Voice of College Football. Yeah. Absolutely. We also- Maybe have a couple of smart fans at 11 o'clock tomorrow, Mark. I don't know. But you're on the SC channel. We will have a lot of smart fans. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and I mistakenly said, join us on the Big 12 channel. We have made that transition. We have beat uh, Oklahoma to the punch, and we have transitioned them to the SEC channel. So join us on the SEC channel. I've left the link in the chat. We also have Maurice here, who has left us a super chat. We appreciate that, Maurice. Finally, somebody agrees with me. Dante Williams cannot coach the defensive backs. Recruiting only, no coaching. Said it all, Maurice, and thanks for the contribution at the Voice of College Football. And I know it's the Voice of College Football, but Matt, you had a, a pretty interesting article. I'm not sure if it was today or it was yesterday. Well, it had to be 
late last night or or today after the uh, Long Beach State loss. Um, Gerardo wants to know, Matt, yeah. before the end, your, your USC thoughts, yeah. basketball yeah. thoughts, please. It's the voice of college football, not the voice of college basketball, but just very quickly because Gerardo, you know, one of our great uh, followers and viewers, wants to know about hoops. Very simple. Andy Enfield should be on the hot seat. He has to get this team to the NCAA tournament. Otherwise, USC should really aspire to do better. And the other just obvious thing to mention, USC men and USC women, they both have the number one recruit in the country for 2023. The women are spectacular, ranked number six in the country, unbeaten. And then you look at the men, five and four, stumbling along, maybe headed for the NIT. So, like, they both have lots of resources, but – Lindsey Gottlieb is an elite coach. Andy Enfield, uh, someone uh, earlier today at Trojans Wire called him Andy Midfield. Ouch, but it's true. And we are leaving in the chat as well. The, oh, I may not have done it correctly, but we will get it, the link to Trojans Wire there with Matt in the chat. Super chat coming in here from Adam. Adam, we appreciate uh, the 20 spot. Matt, why in God's name did we join the Big Ten? We are going to force our players to fly across the country multiple times to play angry, hungry, poor, and pissed off teams in cold weather. We will lose. Terrible decision. So, Adam... You know, f first off, thank you, Adam, for the super chat. And, you know, you you give a lot of uh, uh, dead presidents to uh, the voice of college football. And that's the answer to the question, right? Like USC got a whole Brinks truck of money uh, in exchange for going to the Big Ten. And I mean, that and that point's been litigated. But but here's the interesting discussion, right? Because, you know, with the Florida State snub for the playoff, that has sped up the time clock, in my opinion, for Florida State leaving the ACC. And if that whole, if the ACC crumbles sooner rather than later, like in the next two, three years, which I think will happen, I think Florida State's definitely out of the ACC by no later than 2026, possibly 2025. If that doomsday clock speeds up and you have another splintering and fragmentation of the map let's say the ACC dies the way the Pac-12 did, we could have in the not too distant future uh, a, a situation where all the university presidents, chancellors say, what, what have the past several years achieved? Like, what has this been all about? Why, why did we do all the things uh, that we did? I think that like in, in, ten, in 10 years, if not maybe eight uh after everyone's collected all the television money for several seasons uh, I, you know i do think that at some point in the tw the 2030s and i know that that's a long uh, way away but i do think that you know like in 10 15 years maybe as early as 7 or 8 years you know l let's just say like 7 to 15 years all right M might be pretty broad pretty general but at some point in the 2030s we're going to have a moment in college sports where we say, what in God's name were we doing uh, in 2021, 22, 23? And I think the map's going to be reconfigured back to something resembling the Pac-12, the, the Southwest Conference, the ACC, uh, the SEC. Like, I don't think this distorted nonsensical you know anti-geography reality that that we're heading into for the next several years i don't think it's going to last the rest of our lifetimes i really don't so so your anger is well founded but it's obviously was for the, te the television money um but i don't think this is going to be a permanent state of being you know for the next several years sure because the, the, the that television money has to be collected but i think uh you know when we're all a lot older and hopefully a lot wiser um, you know, th there, there's going to be a moment where everyone stops and says, you know, what the heck were we thinking? And, uh, we'll have a return to the old map in college sports. Matt, do you think we'll arrive at that destination because of 
wiser heads prevailing like you are alluding to or just because we will arrive at a place where it will almost naturally fall into such large mega conferences that it will require a divisional split and then the geography takes over because that's where the rivalries are and that's what makes sense in regards to travel and, and so maybe we'll just kind of sh phase into that um in a sense, I, I would like that if we could somehow get back to, I don't know, maybe eight conferences that were all kind of competitive and then we could have a true playoff. That would be something special. Maybe get back down to 10, you know, teams. So everyone plays each other within conference. That would be kind of cool. And then all eight teams with their champion go and play uh, in, in a real playoff. That would be amazing. But my worry is, is by the time they do that, Matt, we already have the haves and have nots of football. Can you imagine the economic gaps the prestige and tradition gaps. A lot, a lot of these programs like like Oregon State and Washington State, they've been able to every once in a while with the right coach, with the right quarterback, with the right kind of group of guys, the right offensive line, make a run at things. You know, as Trojans, we know that for a fact. Um, but I wonder what this long layoff being put on, you know, by being relegated, for lack of a better term, for a while, when you come back, what what will that have done to your the prestige of your program? What will that have done your, for your facilities, right? Everyone's going to be light years ahead of facilities-wise. I wonder if we may irreparably hurt the, uh, the the smaller programs in the process. But I do agree with you. I think I think this model, I don't think it's sustainable. You know, so Mark, in terms of answering your question, I don't think it's going to be, be like a you know the merging into the super conferences and everyone's hands going to be kind of forced. I think it's going to be you know tennis players and cr cross country athletes and and uh v baseball players you know flying from uh you know chestnut hill uh to berkeley you know boston college cal acc baseball you know just how many of those really really long commutes for all of the you know non-revenue sports and in and in sports where for athletes who you know don't have as much upside in terms of nil because like if you're a gymnast at lsu or, you know, or in a, another uh, SEC uh, school where where gymnastics is king, and or if you like, if you're a volleyball player at Nebraska where that's huge, you know, you're fine. But for all of the programs where you know a particular non-revenue slash Olympic sport is not an NIL uh, money cannon, um, you know, all that long accumulated travel, it like several years of that is just going to probably you know influence uh athletes decisions and you'll you'll see programs erode and you'll you'll hear enough uh you know comments about fatigue and you know the mental health of athletes not being uh what it should be you know players being exhausted and i think just several years of that accumulated negativity that's gonna that's gonna get the attention of uh, the presidents and chancellors there's going to have to be a lot of that to negate and override football money. I'm not saying that it won't happen, and I'm not yeah. saying that I won't be supportive of it because I will be, uh, because this is just, it's just too much. And you, and, you know, it does bring up the point that we could have, you know, the football map might stay intact, but then you go back to the old conferences for the other sports, which has always made a lot of sense to me that why why do you have to carry every single sport with you across conferences why can't you just have a like you know the pac-12 has great swimming and diving and water polo and beach volleyball programs like they should just continue to play each other in perpetuity stanford cal ucla uh usc you know they, they like they should be playing forever you shouldn't be you messing that up but you know uh it didn't happen but like things like that so you could just see the football map remain uh intact but then you know you'll see a pullback and a, and a revision for all the other uh non-revenue slash olympic sports and for those of us who don't watch any hockey but may get caught up in the frozen four let's say well you'll notice there might be a michigan there there might be a minnesota there then usually two or three schools that you've never heard of if you're just strictly a football fan because they're smaller schools but midwest big 10 hockey wrestling yes there's just no 
continuity there in regards to the the regional sports preferences outside of the major sports. Adam, thank you so much for engaging in the conversation and keeping us going here. Thank you for that, Adam. Guys, when I graduated from USC, Stephen Sample was the president and one of the best. Since I graduated, we've had Hayden, Swan, Helton, Bone, Hackett, and now Fult. What is the board of trustees doing? Well, I don't know how you left Nikias out of that because that's really there. He was part of the problem for a lot, a lot of things that happened at USC. Uh, I'm actually happy with what Fult and Bone have done. I mean, Adam, I know you clearly are not a Lincoln Riley fan, but what what Fult and Bone did for this football program is is light years compared to where we were just a few years ago. And it looks like under the leadership of Carol Fult that this is going to continue to improve like we're seeing in this offseason. Um, I, I do feel you for a lot of those, but I also do believe that Hackett was there for Sample. Sample was there for Hackett, um, but I don't think he was worried about hiring the football coach. So I, I you got a lot of years of anger in there, and I get it, but I think we have happier times now and going forward. Matt, your thoughts on – we're mixing a bunch of like 80s and – coaches yeah. and, and presidents <laughs> together there, but I get your point, Adam. Well, I would just mention that, you know, Mike Bone obviously, you know, was not very professional in his conduct and how he behaved, how he treated women like that. That seems pretty on the record in terms of, you know, the whole story of Mike Bone's career, but purely in terms of hiring coaches, which is, you know, the cent the central job of an athletic director along with uh, raising funds, but like, you know, most in the public eye and in the public memory, most athletic directors are graded on how they hire coaches. Mike Bone hired some really good coaches. Stankowitz, uh, Lincoln Riley, Lindsey Gottlieb, you know, like USC is going to be in a women's final four before too long, most likely. Um, you know, a lot of really good stuff happened under Mike Bone's tenure, even if, you know, he was a jerk and, and, and you know, did, did some things that were very unprofessional. So a lot of USC sports programs are in a much better place now than they were before. I can say that like, you know, Tim's an alum. So he has a, you know, his finger on the pulse of the university at a, at a deeper level than I do. Um, but I can certainly say that us, a lot of USC's uh, sports programs are in a better place. Facilities are being upgraded. Like, you know, it's, it's going in the right direction, not the wrong one. I would be curious to know Adam's, preference when Lincoln Riley was hired, who he wanted? That, that's a good question because we never asked him that. Adam, we'll, we'll have to address that at some point. Because at some point, Adam absolutely did. A, he has been a, a harsh critic, and, and a lot of what Adam has said has been spot on. I don't agree with everything he says, but some of the things clearly um, uh, have been correct. You know, And hopefully, again, Adam, we're, we're seeing... You know, I hope this offseason does something to get you pointed in the right direction. Then we see some, if it does transfer to the football fields, W's, hopefully he can win you over. No, no, well. You got me speechless, Adam. I don't know. <laughs> well, that, well that, that choice would look much different today than it did at the time that he was the head coach. You know, that you know what, though? I've said this many times. And I'm probably going to be crucified in the chat here right now. But, and again, I don't know. There are all the rumors that, that happen, you know, the Sun Bowl and all the stuff is going on with the big donors and the local high schools, et cetera. But you look back at the past 10 years and, you know, maybe Kiffin would have been, because re realize what Kiffin was able to do during those sanctions was, was marvelous. They literally won, I believe they won a recruiting title with like 13 or 14 guys, I think, because yeah, it just, the, the, his recruiting was lights out. I mean, nationally lights out. Uh, you know, look at what look at what came after Kiffin, you guys. Maybe if we had written out with Kiffin, yeah, he was having some major issues and some growing up issues, but it couldn't have been worse than what we went through. I'll tell you that. Just because I enjoy uh, at times being the contrarian and taking on uh, the devil's advocate it, Sometime during the off season, we'll have to take up a uh, Clay Hilton argument, and I'll stick up for him. 
you know, a lot of a lot of the USC fans, I remember it um, when he was the head coach, were all over him for his play calling. And that was one thing I said, okay, look, he may not be a great head coach, but the fans were livid about this guy's a bum. He can't what does he know about offense? He can't he can't call an offense. And I just that was right around the time where I really stopped. I was fully in the message board because I was like a freak. And that was right around that time where I started kind of pulling back and going, you know, maybe I gotta spend my time just more productively than being on here. Well, Mar you know, Mark, you mentioned Clay Helton, and, and I can't end this show without making one point, particular point, uh, in terms of tying together one USC team to one of the teams that made news uh, in 2023 in this college football season. I can't shake the similarities uh, between 2016 USC and 2023 Arizona. You know, it is just striking to look at those two teams and consider the parallel trajectories that in 2016, it was Clay Helton not starting Sam Darnold on day one, but he puts him in a few weeks into the season uh, and, and USC takes off and USC goes nine and three and, and USC was playing the best football in America uh, when that 2016 season ended. And you compare that to what happened with Arizona uh, this season, you know, with Jaden Delora getting hurt and Noah Fafita stepping in uh, like three, four weeks in, pretty much the same timeline as Darnold seven years ago. And Arizona goes nine and three. And there were very few teams playing as well as Arizona was at the end of the season. So it's remarkable how what Clay Elton uh, went through at USC in 2016, really a, an eerily similar uh, journey traced by Jed Fish in Arizona uh, seven years later. Yeah. And in a college football season in which there was colossal debate following the Florida state snub. And certainly I believe that there are valid arguments on both sides. I stick up for Florida state because I stand up for the conference championship and for the record, but certainly there is a component that can easily be argued about selecting the four best teams, and the committee's not always done that. And looking back at that 2016 USC team that uh, many believe was a top four team at the conclusion of the season, didn't have the resume to match because it took them a while to figure out who should be the quarterback, and they lost, what, three of four to start the season at one and three, but uh, beat a Washington team that made the playoffs by two scores on the road. And that was the the best indicator of where that conference stood for the rest of the season and how much better USC was than the Washington Huskies. All right, folks, appreciate you being here. Trojan at Conquest Live. It's every Monday with these two, Tim Prangley and Matt Zemick. Please join a Matt Egent every day at Trojan's Wire. We have left the link in the chat. Uh, check out Tim's uh, Matt's work there. And uh, we will see you back here next Monday, 8 Pacific time. And if there's breaking news, Tim and Matt will get on it at some point. So please subscribe. You can uh, do that very easily. The button's right down by Matt, down in the corner uh, closest to Matt. So hit the subscribe button. Just turn on the bell for the notifications. And therefore, you know, when we go live. Adam, thank you for your support in particular, but we appreciate everyone being here at the Voice of College Football USC. We've got a big day lined up for all of you tomorrow, so please lock in on the various channels. If you don't know what's going on at the Voice of College Football, the best way to find out is just go to the main channel. You go to the community page. We set up the schedule each and every day. I have posted the one for Tuesday with, I believe, seven live streams throughout the day. Folks, we appreciate you being here. We will see you back here next Monday. Free Reggie.